Great, uh, thank you so much. I think I will just have to use the uh, um, the slide slideshow to 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 present instead of the the full screen view. So just just make sure uh, you can see my first slides, right? So what I have on my first slides is effects of drugs on zebrafish choice behavior. And I'd like to thank Barbara uh, for organizing this uh, conference. It's been really um, amazing to hear um, works on zebrafish um, behavior and neuroscience. So for my talk today, I would like to uh, first introduce a little bit uh, uh, about uh, choice behaviors and what are choice behaviors um, and, uh, and how decision making uh, is important for um, proper uh, execution of um, behavior choices. And also I'd like to introduce uh, two of the behavior paradigms that we use to study choice behavior in zebrafish. So one is the learned choice behavior which um, is basically the condition place preference behavior paradigm that we have been using to study the effects of uh, a substance of abuse. And, and also I would like to talk about an innate choice behavior that we have been studying. That is a light dark preference behavior. So for both of these behavior um, phenotypes, uh, I will introduce um, to you um, our studies in both adult zebrafish as well as larva zebrafish. So uh, decision making is actually a fundamental um, um, function across all animal kingdoms. So it's not unique to humans or to mammals because uh, proper decision making is essential for the survival and fitness, not only to individuals, but also to the population and species. So in some cases, the behavior um, related to decision-making is actually not just for an individual's uh, purpose and goal. Sometimes it's really to, uh, for the, the, the overall survival and fitness of the, the population. So decision-making has attracted a lot of interest uh, you know, across many different disciplines from uh, psychology to neuroscience to computational uh, science. So, um, and, and economic science. So it's a very, very broad uh, topic. So um, many diverse problems have been studied and there's many diverse solutions have been uh, um, basically understood. Um, so however, a uh, really understanding of decision-making at cellular uh, resolution and also at molecular level uh, had really only been uh, achieved in invertebrate systems. Um, so a lot needs to be understood in vertebrates. Zebrafish actually, um, in my uh, opinion, actually presents a really good model system, a model vertebrate to understand a circuitry involved in decision-making at cellular and molecular basis. So why do we care about decision-making? Well, of course, uh, dysfunction in decision-making is associated with many psychiatric disorders, for example, addiction and, and schizophrenia. So um, being able to understand um, at cellular and molecular level how decision-making circuitry operates will shed important light on understanding these um, diseases. So I first, I like to uh, talk a little bit about zebrafish. So, you know, have you, you have already heard from uh, many uh, very interesting talks. Um, so the, the points that I like to make is, um, is adult zebrafish versus larva zebrafish. So I would like to sort of first describe a few um, strengths and limitations for each system. So first, adult zebrafish. We know that adult zebrafish has a mature nervous system, and they also have many uh, sophisticated behaviors, including learning and the memory. Um, however, the limitation of adult zebrafish is that the adult brain uh, is quite complex. Uh, and also it's not transparent and not very accessible to a uh, cellular um, level um, analysis. So on the other hand, lava zebrafish has a very simple and a transparent brain. And we also know that lava zebrafish is free living by five day old. So they need to hunt for food and escape from predators in, the in their natural environment. So functional circuitries underlying this type of uh, you know, behaviors already um, existing and also highly accessible. And lava zebrafish is also small, 
and, and available in large quantities, so uh, making them suitable for uh, high throughput screenings. However, larval zebrafish also have limitations, so their nervous system is not yet fully mature, and they also lack um, sophisticated behaviors uh, that, for example, involve learning and memory. So I'd like to first uh, talk about uh, our our work on conditioned place preference behavior, in short, known as CPP. So this behavior has been really, this paradigm has been used a lot uh, in, in mammalian rodent systems. So, uh, so basically it's, um, it's, it's basically two uh, in uh, compartments. Uh, each compartment would have uh, different uh, sensory um, cues, either visual, sometimes uh, textual uh, 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 differences. And then uh, there is a, um, a chamber where you can introduce the, the animal. Um, so sometimes the, this middle chamber is not present. And then you would allow the animal to be freely explore, explore these, these chambers. So we can look at the, the sort of a simpler paradigm that I draw on the left here in zebrafish. So, so you will first introduce zebrafish into this, uh, this compartment. And then it has free access to both sides. So you can uh, monitor the time the fish spend, um, whether there is an initial uh, preference for, for example, the dotted side versus the, the white side. And then you would expose zebrafish to uh, certain drugs um, in a confined uh, region, for example, only on the white side. And then 24 hours later, you will reintroduce the zebrafish in a drug-free uh, condition and then allow the zebrafish to, uh, to freely explore both, uh, both sides. And then you can measure the time zebrafish spend in the drug-paired side versus the non-drug-paired side. So this you can derive the change in preference before uh, and after the drug exposure will allow us to know whether the fish has developed a condition place preference for the drug-paired side. So first, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about our um, uh, previous work on adult uh, morphine CPP. So as we all know, morphine is a, um, uh, a very addictive uh, drug. It's also a, a widely used pen medication. Uh, however, the, 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 you know, the unfortunate side effect is, is uh, this dependence that, that, uh, that has been observed. You know, there's this um, opiate pandemic um, in, in the United States you know, as, as we speak. So, um, so what we did is a, a experiment to see whether a zebrafish, so adult zebrafish will display a morphine CPP. So what I show here is the uh, CPP chamber that we use. So this is a three, uh, three chamber design. You can see a dotted uh, side and a white side and then a middle gray side where the zebrafish is first introduced. And then it would, then we will pair the zebrafish uh, with morphine uh, only on the dotted side and then without morphine on the white side and then 24 hours later we let the zebrafish to choose you know which side they like to to spend on um so the so we we measure the initial percent time the fish spend in the dotted side versus white side and we we basically exclude individuals who are, have a strong biased preference for either side so, so the individuals that we include in our study generally uh, have no initial preference in for dotted or white side. And then you can see after they, um, you know, being paired with morphine. So, and then the y-axis here, we're looking at the percent time in the compartment before and after conditioning, right? So you can see the, the, the after conditioning, the, those that paired with morphine show a significant increased uh, percentage time spent in the morphine paired compartment comparing to the control, which are not exposed to morphine, but through what was carried out through the same uh, uh, experimental um, procedure. And also we observe this uh, effect to be, uh, you know, there, there we have carried out experiments in a variety of ways. So for example, pairing a morphine with dotted side versus with the white side uh, pairing with morphine first, and then the uh, the control the you know non drug side second. I'll pair morphine second with the, the drug side first. So all of these we can see a significant um, preference for morphine paired side. 
And also uh, different concentrations, we looked at this is a dose dependent effect. You can see at low doses of morphine, the effect is not very obvious. Uh, at three microm or 7.5 microm, we can see a significant increase in uh, CPP uh, toward the morphine paired side. But at a higher concentration, the effect goes away as well. So it is a very uh, concentration dependent uh, effect on CPP. And we can also measure the morphine concentration in the brain. So the concentration that I show here are concentration in the water, right? So uh, uh, one nice thing about um, doing pharmacology in zebrafish is that you can directly put a lot of these drugs in the water. And then, and then these drugs can you know, get into the brain. So to verify whether the drugs actually um, get into the brain, we have done um, LC-MS-MS measurement of morphine concentration in the brain, right? So you can see that here. Uh, so what we did is you can look at the three micro M um, morphine concentration in the water. It will translate into um, about seven nanomotor uh, morphine concentration in the brain. And then we also looked at whether the uh, if we take the zebrafish out of the morphine and in 15 minutes, what what's remaining in the brain? And then we can observe a decrease of morphine in the brain, suggesting that that our measurements are accurate. And then this is due to you know metabolism of, of morphine leads to a decreased concentration. So these concentrations that we can detect in the brain are, are, are rather physiologically relevant. So therefore, um, we can conclude that at the, in the physiologically relevant concentration of morphine, zebrafish actually show a, a quite um, significant and robust um, CPP toward morphine. So uh, we know that if it is uh, truly dependent on the opioid signaling pathway, and then we should be able to block this CPP um, by uh, we're using, using the drug uh, naloxone. Naloxone is a general opioid receptor antagonist. And indeed, when we uh, administer naloxone, you can see the morphine-induced CPP is abolished. So we also looked at uh, morphine-induced, uh, no, sorry, the, the food CPP. So instead of using morphine, one can use food as a reward in the same paradigm. And we can also observe a food uh, CPP and this food CBP is also blocked um, at this concentration of naloxone. So suggesting that um, there's some shared uh, common signaling pathways in the brain. So we also want to see if we can uh, see the effect uh, using genetic uh, mutants in zebrafish. So we have previously, um, through a forward genetic screen, we have previously isolated a zebrafish mutant, which we named too few. So the too few mutant uh, was interesting um, because we um, um, found that it has reduced uh, dopaminergic neurons. You can see that uh, these uh, staining here are dopaminergic neurons in the wild type sibling. And in the too few mutant, uh, this is a two day old zebrafish, embryonic zebrafish, the dopamine neurons is significantly reduced. So we have later characterized the dopaminergic as well as serotonergic neuronal states in the in the older to few lava zebrafish in the six day old lava zebrafish. So here are the basically we can observe distinct clusters of dopaminergic, um, and norogenergic, as well as serotonergic neurons um, in the brain, and and we found that the regions that are highlighted in this black uh, color are basically the regions as well as this uh, dark. Uh, hashed lines, these, these regions, the monoaminergic neurons are significantly reduced in the two field mutant. So um, furthermore, when we carried out more analysis of the two field um, mutant, we have actually found more um, broad defects in this in this mutant. So a uh, two field mutant is adult viable. So um, so one of uh, our graduate students in the lab um, a couple of years, several years ago was interested in in looking at the, the two few, um, actually I forgot to mention two few encodes a transcription factor known as uh, FESF2. So FESF2 uh, is a zinc finger transcription factor that play very important roles in neuronal um, development uh, as well as differentiation. So, um, so because of that, and we observed that FESF2 expression is actually not limited to monoaminergic neurons, but rather expressed in the uh, fall brain. So um, 
we looked at the adult zebrafish brain just under um you know like dissecting microscope we can already see a very severe dif uh, defects in the homozygous comparing to their wild type as well as heterozygous siblings what you can see is that the cerebellum and the uh, optic tectum look quite quite comparable with their siblings but if you look at the telencephalic region it's significantly smaller comparing to wild type and heterozygous as I told you, the 2 field fez f 2 gene is expressed strongly in the developing fall brain. So, so therefore, uh, although, although in six-day-old lava zebrafish, we do not detect a brain size difference, telencephalic size difference, so suggesting this these, um, difference is because uh, the post-larval telencephalic growth defect in the 2 field uh, mutant. So these are quantifications to show that the, the, the telencephalic is significantly smaller in the homozygous mutant. So uh, uh, Michael, the graduate student, have carried out further molecular and cellular studies. So basically, um, so he used um, uh, molecular techniques such as, um, you know, antibody staining uh, for uh, um, BLBP, which is a, a, a astroglia marker. And he also used uh, anti-HUC, which is a marker for, uh, for uh, neurons. He also used a PCNA, which is a marker for prol proliferative um, cell types. So, so, um, so I will not go into details about, about this paper, but, but to mention um, that the too few mutant um, has in fact increased adult born neurons. However, these neurons fail to undergo proper maturation. So even though the too few mutant telencephalon is filled with neurons, but these neurons do not grow uh, necessary processes, as you can see here. So in a, in a healthy uh, sibling brain, if you label a single neuron, you can see this elaborated uh, axonal dendritic processes. But in the homozygous too few mutant, these neurons are, are ra rather rather bold, so they don't they don't grow these processes. So therefore. Even though the brain is packed with more neurons, these neurons um, do not grow processes. Therefore, the total volume is decreased in the two field mutant brain. So, to summarize, the two field mutant defect is that uh, during larva stage, there is a defect in monoaminergic neurons. However, in the adult stage, the telencephalic uh, um, region is significantly decreased in size due to a uh, significant um, defect in uh, white matter um, production, not actually in, in the birth of neurons. OK, so with knowing this defect uh, of the too few um, mutant brain, so now let's come back to look at some of the, the behavior uh, defects that we have observed previously. So uh, just using a simple locomotor assay, we can, we can detect that the too few mutant actually has significantly reduced uh, velocity, swim speed, comparing to the wild type. So, um, and we also uh, looked at the visual uh, effect um, of this wild type and the too few mutant using a um, visual acuity assay. Basically, we um, put zebrafish into a, a, a circle, circular compartment, and then, then we, we ring a, a, basically have a, a black bar like moving around this compartment, and then we observe the uh, the number of uh, responses that zebrafish um, have to this bar, and then if they're visually impaired, they will not uh, respond properly. So the two field mutant actually have no visual defect, so they, their their visual um, acuity and is normal, but they do have a reduced uh, locomotor activity comparing to control. So this is not surprising because they have defects in dopaminergic neurons and the dopaminergic neurons are known to be very important for locomotor uh, regulation. So then we looked at uh, what happens to the too few mutant if we put um, them through the, the CPP um, behavior paradigm. So, um, so here is where you can see. Um, so let's see. Uh, so the first of all, uh, the initial preference for um, for the the white and and the dotted side uh, for the dotted side is not different between wild type and too few, um, and then their food preference here is not different surprisingly. 
So if you uh, if we do a food CPP and then we we see that they can both learn where the food uh, is. However, we observed a very um, very significant defect in the too few uh, mutant in terms of their morphine CPP. So for example, we tested this at two different morphine concentrations here, three microam in the water or 7.5 microam in the water. So you can see the wild type siblings have a significant uh, change in preference, showing their preference for morphine. And the uh, too few mutant had a significant decrease. At a higher concentration, the decrease is even more um, more pronounced. So there, therefore, the too few mutant display normal food CPP, but but not morphine CPP. Okay, so uh, so now I like to uh, tell you about another substances uh, that we have tested in the uh, using the CPP paradigm. So that is alcohol, as you have heard from um, um, Professor Rosenberg talk about alcohol. So alcohol is actually uh, you know uh, also a a addictive uh, substance and also uh, widely uh, abused uh, in the in the population. So it will be uh, interesting to know, uh, you know, we're interested in knowing how does alcohol um, generate these um, rewarding uh, reinforcing effects. So whether zebrafish uh, can also elicit such, um, you know, ha have such uh, effect, wild alcohol have such reinforcing effect in zebrafish. So here again, we use the same uh, CPP chamber, and then the, the procedure is quite similar. So we will record the initial preference for alcohol, and then we will uh, conditioning them with alcohol. Uh, so a control, we were conditioning it with just systems water. And then 24 hours later, we test their final preference in the, in the chamber. And then we can observe uh, a quite a robust um, effect of alcohol um, even after a single um, pairing single exposure so this uh, this effect is also dose dependent um, okay so yeah so so by um, looking at um, two drugs one is morphine the other is alcohol in adult zebrafish we can see that adult zebrafish uh, display um, cpp to both drugs suggesting that these uh, drugs which have reinforcing effects in mammals also have reinforcing effects in zebrafish. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, lava zebrafish present some uh, strengths uh, to study the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms. So we're interested in knowing whether we could develop similar reinforcing paradigms uh, in lava zebrafish. So we have first tried the same paradigm that we used for the adult zebrafish. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't see any CPP, uh, uh, you know, using lava zebrafish up to like two weeks, uh, two to three weeks old. The, the effect is just very, very uh, weak. So therefore, um, a former postdoc in the lab have devised a, a, a somewhat different uh, strategy to look at a morphine preference in lava zebrafish. So, uh, so she has read uh, some papers uh, in in rodent studies, which shows that if you if you pre-expose the animals to a drug, right, and then later on you can find they have an enhanced preference for the drug. So what she did is uh, uh, Sandrine. What she did is she basically uh, have a control uh, and versus morphine pre-exposed lava zebrafish. And then she, uh, 24 hours later, she would introduce them into a, a chamber. In this case, um, it, it, this chamber has um, drug on board. So with one side of the chamber, she would deliver a morphine solution. Uh, and then on the other side, it counterbalanced with a water stream. And then at the, at the middle, in the middle of the chamber, uh, in the bottom, there is a drain. So they will allow us basically to establish a gradient of morphine on one side, uh, but not on the other side. So then, uh, then she monitored the number of lava zebrafish that are present on the, the morphine side versus the, the water side. And then, and then this is the percent diff um, preference that, that she would uh, compute. And so, so she tried first, tried one week old fish and did not see any uh, significant effect. So then she tried two week old lava zebrafish. And, and at this stage, she was able to see a um, 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 
a morphine concentration dependent effect. So, so the concentration shown here are the morphine pre-exposure concentration. Okay, so and you can see that um, you know in the naive uh, lava zebra fish, if you test them in the water and water chamber, they don't show any percent preference. And then if in the in the lava zebra fish that are not pre-exposed and naive lava zebra fish, if you test them in the morphine water chamber, they show a very weak weak preference for the morphine side. But if you pre-expose them to you know, uh, certain concentrations of morphine, and then you can see uh, there's a significant uh, increase in, in um, preference for the morphine. Um, so, so we were concerned whether this effect could be due to simply due to olfactory uh, stimulation. Uh, so therefore we tested a, another compound uh, called morphilin. So morphilin is actually not a, um, a psychostimulant. So morphilin is known to be an imprinting odorant. So this, uh, this particular chemical um, have been used in studying, uh, you know, this homing, this imprinting behavior in, in um, commercial fish. Uh, so we know that, you know, fish can, should be able to detect these drug, uh, this particular chemical. So what we see that we do the same experiment with morphilin, and then we do not see a, a preference, increased preference. And then secondly, uh, to, to see that whether the effect is central versus simply peripheral, like olfactory, we looked at a morphine opioid receptor, mu opioid receptor expression in lava zebrafish brain. So we noticed that mu opioid uh, receptor is expressed in the brain. So here is in the more in the fall brain region. And we do not see mu opioid receptor expression in the olfactory epithelium, which is the nose. Um, but o o odorant receptors, like olfactory receptors, we can easily detect their expression in the olfactory epithelium. So these uh, together suggest that the morphine preference effect that we observe is not due to olfactory stimulation. Um, so then we looked at whether these morphine preference can be blocked by mu opioid receptor antagonist naloxone, and the answer is yes. So when we co-administer uh, or pre-expose to naloxone, and then this, this morphine preference uh, behavior is significantly reduced. But surprisingly, naloxone did not block the food, uh, food CPP, food preference in lava zebrafish in this particular paradigm. If you see that, you know, so here, if we do a food and water uh, chamber, we can see that the lava zebrafish shows a significant preference for the food side. Um, but with naloxone, we, we, did, we were not able to block this effect very much, yeah. Um, so again, we tested two field mutant. Uh, so the two field larval mutant zebrafish also shows a very significantly decreased uh, morphine preference uh, in, this, uh, in this paradigm. You can see that they, um, at different concentrations we tested, the two field uh, mutant preference is significantly uh, different from the, the control. Um, however, too few did not, again, did not block the food preference uh, in this chamber. So suggesting that the, uh, the circuitry that's affected in the too few mutant is, is somehow um, uh, quite restricted. Um, all, the, all the food preference may be mediated by um, much broader and redundant pathways uh, in the brain. So uh, dopamine is a well-known uh, uh, neurotransmitter involved in reward. And so um, Sandrine also tested the effect of uh, antagonizing dopamine signaling, uh, whether it affects the morphine preference that she observed in lava zebrafish. And, and uh, she used a, a D1 antagonist. And you notice that, um, yes, the dopamine D1 antagonist can block morphine preference at, uh, in a concentration dependent uh, dependent manner. And again, interestingly, these D1 antagonists did not affect food preference as much as, we, um, as we, we've seen with the, the morphine preference, suggesting that the, the, you know, the animals, the, the, their, their drive for, for food um, is mediated potentially by a multiple uh, redundant pathways in the brain. So to summarize this part of my talk, so I told you about uh, a conditioned uh, place preference behavior that we have uh, been studying uh, in both adult zebrafish as well as lava zebrafish. 
And now in adult zebrafish, we used a conditioned place preference, CPP, which is a, a learning paradigm. Um, and we observed zebrafish display CPP to both morphine and alcohol after only a single uh, exposure. And then in lava zebrafish, we could not uh, get CPP to work, uh, potentially because uh, their brain is immature. And so the learning and the memory, all memory circuitry is not well formed. So we uh, use a modified uh, morphine preference paradigm. And we were able to show that lava zebrafish actually also display morphine preference uh, after single um, pre-exposure. And then um, basically we have validated these behaviors using pharmacology, like opioid antagonists. We also validated this behavior using a genetic uh, mutant uh, in zebrafish. And we also uh, observed a, a different differential sensitivity to this pharmacological and genetic perturbations uh, in terms of the food um, preference. Uh, as well as the drug preference. So, so there seems to be the food preference is mediated by multiple redundant pathways in the brain, whereas the drug preference can be uh, blocked by the um, you know, uh, pharmacology that targeting uh, opioid signaling, dopamine signaling, uh, and by the, the genetic mutant, the two few mutant. Okay, so, um, so now I'd like to switch to tell you about um, a, a different behavior. So, um, so as I mentioned, the CPP is a learned uh, behavior, whereas um, uh, the behavior that I'm going to tell you about now is actually an innate uh, choice behavior. So it's a, a light dark preference behavior. So you know we all living, uh, we all live on the Earth, uh, which um, has this um, circadian cycles. So so the light and dark have um, very important, significant meanings to all living organisms um, on, on Earth. So uh, not surprisingly, this light dark preference behavior is actually very conserved across species from very simple organisms such as Drosophila. So uh, researchers have ob observed this distinct light dark preference behavior. Very interestingly, Drosophila lava you know, it, basically it's the, the, you know, sort of similar to the zebrafish lava. So the Drosophila lava avoid light. So if you see in this little graph here, if you put uh, like Drosophila lava in this, in this um, circular dish that have, you know, dark regions versus the light regions. And what you notice in, in about five minutes, most of this lava will crawl into the dark side and then they avoid the light side. Uh, and interestingly, in Drosophila adults, they actually prefer light. So, so there are studies um, uh, using the, just the power of Drosophila genetics to really dissect the circuitry that are regulating this behavior. So similarly, in uh, adult uh, mammals like, uh, like uh, mice, they also show distinct light-dark preference behavior. So uh, you know, mouse being a nocturnal animal, so they, they tend to avoid light. So in the adult, uh, adult rodents, they avoid light. So um, similarly, um, adult zebrafish um, also avoid light. So, uh, so um, in addition to our study, there are several uh, other groups have also observed this behavior. So uh, we sort of got into this behavior um, quite, um, quite accidentally because initially we were trying to develop the CPP paradigm. So we, we were trying to use like the light and dark, you know, distinct visual cues. But we noticed that there is a strong biased um, preference for these visual cues. Um, so therefore, we had to change it to the white versus dotted compartment, because you know what we noticed is that you know when we put adult zebrafish in this half light and half dark uh, chamber, we noticed that they they spend significantly more time in the dark side, so they avoid light. So to quantify this behavior, we we developed this. Um, um, basically, very simple choice index. So we do the percent time they spend in the dark minus the percent time they spend in the light during that like uh, eight minute, you know, observation period. And so, so if you have a choice, if this individual have a choice of uh, index of one, so that means they spend all their time in the dark side, right? If they have a choice index about zero, then that, that means they spend half, you know, equal time in the light and dark side. But if they have a choice index of negative one. So that it means they spend all their time in the light side, right? So you can see that adult zebrafish, they spend significantly more time in the dark side. 
um, because you can see that the, the, the choice index is positive. And then these um, significant um, preference for the dark side or, or, or a version of the light side can be uh, significantly altered by two uh, drugs. Um, one of them is um, chlorodipoxide. It's basically a benzodiazepine-like anxiolytic drug. And the second is buspiron. Uh, as you heard from Professor um, Rosenberg's talk, that this, this drug is used um, also, you know, it's a serotonin um, uh, agonist that's uh, used also as hum uh, anxiolytics in human, um, treat, treat human anxiety. So you can see both of these anxiolytic drugs can significantly decrease um, their, their time spent um, in, the, in the dark side. So suggesting they're coming out more to the light side. So they're, they're less, they find the light side less aversive. Um, so we also, um, obviously, you know, whenever you have a change of behavior, uh, we don't know whether it's indeed the change of the underlying, um, you know, fear, uh, anxiety-like state, or whether it's a change in their, simply in their um, locomotor capabilities or, or their visual, you know, visual capabilities, right? So therefore we have uh, also tested um, their locomotor activity. Uh, and you can see that uh, clodazepoxide, which is a GABA agonist, you know, does, does lower their swim speed quite, quite significantly, but buspiron um, did not change their uh, swimming capabilities. So, um, however, this decrease in the uh, speed uh, will not account for the, the change in preference because, because the chamber is relatively small. Even at this speed, the fish can easily go to um, you know, both sides. It's not like they're, they're incapacitated, not being able to move. So they're still able to, to go to um, both sides. And the secondly, you know, if their vision is changed, obviously, if they're, if they're visually impaired by these, these drugs, then they probably will show a decreased preference um, for either side, right? So therefore, we, we check their visual response using the same paradigm that we used uh, earlier, and we did not see any um, effect on their vision. So therefore, um, this, this analysis suggests that these drugs um, potentially um, indeed change the in internal state of, of zebrafish, um, you know, fear or anxiety like, like internal states. Um, so so the, the, the previous paradigm that I showed you is basically involves we just net zebrafish into this chamber and then we just, um, you know, track their behavior for eight minutes. So we know that netting, you know, handling is a variable, right? So, you know, sometimes you could, you, you could catch the fish quickly. Sometimes you have to chase them uh, quite a bit before you can get the fish. So therefore, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an uncontrollable variable. So because of that, we, we decided to, um, you know, come up with a paradigm where, where we don't have to net the fish. So we simply only present the, the visual uh, stimuli as the, the light and dark uh, images. So to see how that, um, you know, then that behavior would be more, um, uh, you know, have less variables. So the way we did that is we, we would put zebrafish on top of a computer screen, uh, and then we will let them habituate overnight. And then when we are ready to do the behavior, we just simply uh, switch the, the, the underlying image from like a, just a grayish um, image to a half white and half black image, right? And so we don't have to go near the fish or, or be, you know, handling them in any ways. So therefore, simply presenting this image, and then we quantified their um, choice index. So indeed, even, you know, without any perturbation or handling, we can also observe a strong, significant preference for the, uh, for the uh, dark side, you can see. And then, and then when we treat them with these two anxiolytics, we can also um, see a significant effect of these drugs. And the, the buspiron effect is particular, particularly striking because if you see that the buspiron treated uh, zebrafish, they actually have a, a choice reversal, meaning that instead of preferring dark side, now they actually show significant preference for the light side. So, so that's quite interesting. Uh, so, so the underlying mechanisms, we still don't know, but, but this, you know, given that buspiron, has a um, serotonergic action. So it would be interesting to know if the serotonergic system actually um, actually mediate this, this potential choice reversal that we have observed. And we also performed, uh, uh, so 
just a little bit background. When we test individual adult zebrafish in the light dark choice chamber, we noticed that some individuals um, actually have a strong light avoidant behavior, while other individuals do not show a very strong light avoidance behavior. So there's this individual variation in this behavior. So taking advantage of this observation, we performed a, a CFOS uh, mapping. So CFOS is an immediate early gene. Uh, essentially, its activities reflect, um, uh, you know, its expression reflects neuronal activity or neuronal activation. So using CFOS mapping, uh, we have observed a very interesting difference in the in the individuals who uh, who avoid light significantly versus individuals who actually don't avoid light significantly. So the, the, the two regions that I want to highlight uh, here is the um, DM and the VD. So DM is the uh, zebrafish um, so, um, homolog of the amygdala, the mammalian amygdala. And then VD is the zebrafish homolog of the mammalian and striatum. So, so uh, you know, amygdala is, is you know, involved in um, fear, anxiety-like behaviors. And then the um, the striatum is involved in you know regulating motor uh, motor behavior. So so it's very interesting to see such a correlation that in the strong light avoidant uh, zebrafish, the DM and VD activity is is significantly higher comparing to the individuals that don't show a strong light avoidant. So yeah. So uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, you know adult zebrafish. While having sophisticated, interesting behaviors, uh, their brain is is very um, is very difficult um, to to penetrate because it's complex and it's not transparent. So therefore, um, we decided to spend more time on looking at a behavior, this behavior, this innate behavior in lava zebrafish. So uh, what I like to tell you is about dark avoidance in lava zebrafish. So yes, you heard it right. So the lava zebrafish avoid dark whereas the adult zebrafish avoid light. So there is a, um, a choice reversal, a developmental uh, stage dependent choice reversal. So as shown here, um, when we test one week and two week old uh, lava zebrafish, we notice a strong, uh, strong, uh, um, basically spend a lot of time on the light side, strong dark version. But in the adult ones around one month old and older, they basically spend a lot of time in the uh, light side, they, 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 they find dark to be aversive. So it's a very interesting behavior change. Uh, we currently do not know what are the neural mechanisms underlying these choice reversal, but something that, that we would you know, be very interested in, in, in continuing to uh, explore. So, um, so to, to further understand whether this dark avoidance behavior in lava zebrafish is also potentially fear anxiety related, uh, we have uh, Yiming Bai, which is a undergraduate uh, student uh, in the lab, had done uh, some really cool experiments. So what he did is, is he said, if this behavior were to be fear anxiety related, then if we um, stress the fish, right, then it should increase their dark avoidance behavior, right? So so he decided to use, um, you know, uh, some some you know per perceived stressors that, that, that he perceived as, as being stressful to fish. For example, heat the fish up to higher temperature uh, or cool them down to lower temperature uh, and then subject them to UV irradiation, you know, brief UV irradiation. And then and he also thought that social isolation would be potentially stressful. So, so he would isolate these individual lava zebra fish. And the, the finally, uh, what he did is he he stirred them. Uh, so he think that mechanical, like just just simply um, stirring them, could be stressful. So he would put subject the zebrafish, uh, you know, into a stir bar, and then he just stir them for like five minutes. And then after these manipulations, he subject these fish uh, to the light dark preference test, uh, comparing to controls that are not stressed. And he also um, performed cortisol. Uh, measurement to see, you know, to to see whether there's physiological um, increase in 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 the in the cortisol levels in these stressed fish. Um, so here are some data. So um, so very interestingly, we observe that the heat is uh, is uh, heat is significantly increase their um, uh, dark uh, avoidance behavior. So they spend even more time comparing to control in the light side. And cold also, 
does um, significantly increase their dark avoidance and UV light um, as well. So all of these three treatment um, increase dark avoidance. Um, so social isolation, on the other hand, did not seem to have a significant effect uh, at this stage. So these are like six, seven day old lava zebra fish. So this is actually not surprising because we know that uh, the social um, you know, interactions in zebra fish actually developed uh, somewhat later uh, and when they get older. So, and it's somewhat surprisingly that the stirring them with a stir bar didn't seem to affect uh, their, um, you know, dark avoidance as much. Uh, so, so perhaps this stimulation is not uh, strong enough, perhaps, or, or not as threatening to the zebrafish, or, or the stirring time is not long enough. So, so yeah, so that basically um, is, is what he found. And so likewise, uh, using, you know, the anxiolytic drugs that, that we used previously on the adult zebrafish, uh, like chlorodipaxide and the biospira, we also observed that, you know, they can significantly decrease their, uh, their dark avoidance, right? So suggesting that, you know, this, this, this behavior uh, is uh, potentially fear and anxiety related. So the heat, um, the heated lava zebrafish uh, also can be uh, their, their dark avoidance can be decreased by these, these anxiolytic drugs. Um, so finally, I'd like to touch upon, uh, um, upon uh, this interesting observation that we made uh, regarding the individual variation in behavior. So I, I mentioned earlier, so the light avoidance behavior in adult zebrafish, um, we observe individual variation, right? So, so likewise, we can also observe individual variation of dark avoidance in lava zebrafish. So for example, when we test a population of uh, lava zebrafish, so you can see that they, uh, their behavior um, shows, um, you know, display a spectrum. So there are some individuals that they strongly dark avoidant, we call it SDA, strongly dark avoidant, because they spend like almost all their time in the, in the light side with a choice index of negative one, right? We also have a majority of the, the, the population seems to hang around in this middle, middle level, right? We call it moderately dark avoidant. We also have some individuals um, that like, they actually spend a lot of time in the light side. We call this a variable dark avoidant. And you'll see why we call it variable dark avoidant a little bit later. So obviously behavior variation is often observed whenever we do experiments. Um, and so the question that we are wondering is, you know, is this behavior variation purely due to uh, environmental effect uh, or, or whether their genetics actually contribute to this um, individual variation in dark avoidance, right? So to address this question, uh, so a research scientist, uh, Mahendra, uh, in the lab, have uh, decided to do uh, the following experiments. So, so basically what uh, he did is he uh, would take uh, the individual larvae and he will record their light-dark preference behavior. Uh, instead of one time, he would record them for four times. So when they're six days old in the a.m. and the, in the p.m., like morning and afternoon. And he will do this again on when they're seven days old, right? So, so therefore, for each individual, he would get four uh, behavior recordings. So just to make sure that, you know, if, if we, you know, if there is environmental effect or sometimes you, you get a choice index, it may not truly represent what that, that animal's, you know, behavior. So therefore, we do multiple, multiple examinations. And then we, um, based on their behavior uh, readouts, we can, we can see, um, we can see quite interesting differences. So here, uh, what I show you here on the x-axis are the individual larvae that he tested. For example, there's about here about, uh, not quite sure, but like 30 larvae that he tested. And then the y-axis is their choice index, right? And then he basically um, sorted them based on their um, their choice index uh, from you know positive to negative, right? So what you'll notice here that the individuals on this end of the graph, uh, two things, right? One is that their choice index is very, very negative, right? Um, close to negative one, meaning that they are strongly uh, dark aversive, right? They don't go to dark side. Um, and then you also look at across the four trials, the variation is very little among these individuals. 
But if you look at on the opposite end of the spectrum, individuals on the on this side. So first of all, their average choice index across four trials is is more on the uh, either you know on the positive side, and what you look at the across the trial differences is huge, right? So these these fish, their behavior is very plastic or very you know variable, if you will. You know, in certain trials they can you know hang out on the dark light side, for example, and then in another trial they hang out on the dark side. So they don't actually. Uh, you know, show a, a very strong. They're very, oh, they're very sensitive to environmental, some environmental variables that are that are present, right? But individuals on this side, they they are their behavior is very very, um, you know, uh, consistent or, or invariable, if you will. So so these are the SDAs and these are the VDAs we call, and then the middle ones are the MDA essentially. So. So what we do is to ask for genetic contribution is basically you we isolate these individuals right VDAs and SDA and we raise them to adults and then we breed them again and then test their be, uh, the, their baby's behavior the behavior of their their progeny right so here you can see that um, we did detect a, a you know a, a significant heritability in this in this behavior traits so if you look at this this dark um, bar this is the parental parental generations. Um, uh, choice. So here is we're looking at a histogram. Okay, the x-axis is choice index. So the plus one meaning all the time spent in the dark. Uh, negative one means all the time spent in the light. Right, and the y-axis is a percentage of lava showing you know particular choice index. So it's it's a distribution histogram. You can see that in the parental population the the distribution is like this. Right. So majority of the, the larvae shows a, a mild, you know, negative 0.5 choice index, but there are some individuals that are, you know, more dark aversive, some individuals, you know, fewer individuals that are actually, you know, a light aversive or, or, or a dark, non dark aversive, right? And then you look at the, the, the next generation, their progeny, the, the next generation, the F that derived from SDA. So SDA is the, is the blue curve. You can see it's significantly shifted toward the, the left side, whereas the red curve is the VDA, right? The next generation of the VDA uh, individuals, and they shifted toward the right side. And we also um, performed statistic analysis. So basically, this is a parental average choice index. This is a, a SDA's progeny, and this is the VDA's progeny. You can see that there is significant difference uh, in the in their in their choice index, and the so the 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 progeny of SDA uh, shows a trend of difference from the parental, but but did not reach significant if we just simply do a a, a t test or ANOVA test. The reason is because um, because of boundary effect. So for example, you can see that you know the the overall F um, parent population already you know toward the negative side, right, in terms of their choice index. So there's a, they're hitting a boundary. So to um, to analyze this, this, this difference, we performed a permutation test. So basically what you do is you take the, you know, the F1 parental population, you have, we have 188 individuals, and then we also have 80 individuals that are the, uh, the progeny of the SDAs, right? And then what we do is we, we mix them, we mix them, and then we randomly distribute you know, pick random individuals like and distribute 180 to this population and 80 to this population, and then we 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 calculate the mean differences, right? So we just do this over. We do this a thousand times, and you can see this is the distribution of all of these permutation analysis, and then you can see the observed uh, observed difference, which is um, is the one that we we indeed observe here, is significantly significantly different from this uh, permutation analysis. We did the same thing with the, the VDA. You can see that the observed is significantly different from this random um, distribution. So therefore, this is, um, um, is, is very significant um, in terms of the difference. We also calculate heritability. So it's, basically, it's um, using a formula um, uh, as shown here. So the uh, heritability H squared equals R divided by S. Uh, so R equals basically the means of the next generation, the F2 generation, minus the means of the parental generation, right? And the S is basically means of the specific uh, F1 parents, like either the FDA, uh, SDA or VDAs, and minus the mean of the 
the F1 parental population. So by doing this heritability calculation, we found that the SDA trait, the heritability is about 0.39. The VDA trait is 0.89. This shows uh, there is significant genetic contribution to this, um, to this behavior variation that we observed. Okay, so to summarize this part of my talk, so I told you about um, an inmate preference behavior, innate choice behavior in zebrafish, such that adult zebrafish, they avoid dark and the lava zebrafish avoid light. And also um, I told you that the extent of, of, of these avoidance behaviors can be significantly attenuated by anxiolytics. And also they can be enhanced by known stressors um, so I did not tell you about adult data, but we have done a similar thing in adults as well. Uh, so therefore, um, these avoidance behaviors um, is likely to be uh, regulated by fear and anxiety like circuitries. And in fact, we have some um, in the new data showing that that's indeed the case. Um, so um, I also told you about this, uh, you know, our interest in this individual variations of behavior. And especially uh, the individual variation of the dark avoidance behavior in lava zebrafish, we found that it's heritable. And also uh, it defines a very different uh, behavior traits, such as the strong dark avoidant, uh, moderate dark avoidant, and then variable dark avoidant. So, so yeah, we're very interested in exploring the, the genetic basis uh, underlying this behavior variation. So finally, I'd like to thank the people who did the work. You know, so this is how we hang out before, and this is, you know, like the same <laughs> or hang out only on, on Zoom meetings. <laughs> so, uh, so I also like to thank the former lab members uh, who have uh, contributed to, to, the, to the work that I, I told you about today. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>